Hello, today we're going to have to talk about Deng Xiaoping's Chinese economic reform. But before we talk about that, we're going to have to talk about Communist China pre-1980, before Deng took power. Leading up to 1970, the Chinese Communist Party had attempted many ambitious projects, including the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. This left China in both political and economic turmoil during the 1970s, and when Mao Zedong died in 1976, a power struggle ensued. When Hua Guofeng was chosen as Mao Zedong's successor, Deng Xiaoping was allowed to assume a position of power in the government, ultimately allowing him to enforce his pragmatic policy. But who was Deng Xiaoping? Born in 1904, he went to study abroad in France and the Soviet Union from 1920 to 1926, where he found his communist roots. This would eventually lead to him joining the Jiangxi Soviet enclave in 1931, before becoming the Chinese Communist Party vice premier over 10 years later. But then he came into conflict with Mao Zedong in ideology, his pragmatic approach to issues not appeasing the ideologues of the Chinese Communist Party. He was eventually attacked by radical supporters of the Mao regime during the Cultural Revolution and was forced to go into hiding. But as the political situation became more turbulent in China, he was allowed to be reinstated as the deputy premier in 1973. His next challenge would be a political struggle against the Gang of Four, a group which contested for power on behalf of an aging Mao Zedong. However, this time, Xiaoping's more pragmatic approach to policy allowed him to gain the upper hand, and with the death of Zhao Enlai and Mao Zedong, the Gang of Four was put at even more of a disadvantage, being eventually arrested by 1980. This allowed Xiaoping to become even more prominent, eventually assuming the role of leader of Communist China. Looking at the Chinese situation from a more practical point of view, Xiaoping had realized that China would not prosper without a capitalist-based economy. This led to him enacting the following three measures. He gave the peasants private property to own and switched away from collectivization. He allowed for relatively more open markets and lessened the state control over the economy. He also focused on improving relationships with other countries and allowed for an increase in trade. Xiaoping believed that rewarding industry and initiative with material incentives would foster economic growth. So he discontinued collectively run state farms and replaced them with peasant farming, the peasants having individual responsibility over what they farm. He also gave more power to industrial enterprises and allowed them to have the ability to determine production levels and their specific pursuit of profits. He also sponsored more international commerce with other nations. For some, even in the Chinese Communist Party, this economic reform had been long overdue. Because the collective economy had been performing so unsatisfactorily, people had begun to lose faith in agricultural collectivization. A system that, quote, gives payment in accordance with actual production, end quote, was seen as an improvement by the office of the Chinese Communist Party at the time. But some believe, even in more recent years, that these revisionist tendencies go against what Mao Zedong championed in the first place. In the 10 declarations of the Maoist Communist Party of China made March 22nd, 2009, it is said, quote, history has shown that if the revisionists get into power, then the workers and peasants shall be cast down. If the revisionists controlled the government, then the proletariat would lose their political power. While this might not be a very publicized or popular view, it shows that some Chinese believe that the communist society envisioned by Mao Zedong has been corrupted into a more capitalist-based society. Xiaoping's economic reforms had both long-standing local and global impacts. He was not only able to bring China out of the dire poverty it experienced during the Cultural Revolution, but was also able to raise education, healthcare, housing, working conditions, and food availability to higher levels than pre-revolutionary era. By improving relations with Europe, Japan, and the US, and allowing Chinese industry to be available worldwide, China has experienced higher agricultural and economic growth than its Indian neighbors. It is interesting to note that even though the United States, Great Britain, Chile, Korea, and Vietnam all supported free market policies and promoted economic liberalization, these Chinese reforms can be argued to be some of the most successful in the long term, as China has developed into one of the greatest economic powerhouses of the 21st century. With its pragmatic style of leadership, this could see China have more impressive growth throughout the 21st century, but they will need to avoid the development of economic and social inequalities that led to their communist revolution in the first place.
Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.